right. Good morning to you all. It is good to see you. I um, uh, the the title of the series that you all are in, building the hearth, is uh, as an idea that is that is that is close to my heart. When we talk about the hearth being, and that's not a word that most of us use in our everyday everyday lives, but it's basically the little thing that you put a fire on. All the preparation, rocks, wood, all those things that, that you use to create, to prepare a place for a fire to not just start, but to remain. Not just start, but to remain. When I was younger, I was in the Boy Scouts, and um, if you know, if you Boy Scout fans have been here, <laughs> okay, yeah, I was uh, like the highest rank is like is Eagle Scout, and I got I didn't get there. Uh, I got to the Life Scout, which is like right underneath it. Um, by that time, I had left and went to college, and it just didn't seem cool anymore to be a Boy Scout, <laughs> and so I was like. You know, as young, going to college, I'm like, you know, I'm, and, and as a single, single guy, I'm like, man, college, this is going to be the promised land. This is going to be the place. You know, I, I just couldn't imagine myself, introduce myself to a girl, but hey, you know, I'm a boy scout. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. You know, I just, <laughs> just didn't seem cool anymore. But one of the things that we did on our way to earning all these different patches and stuff was going on on real camping trips. And uh, when you're out on a real camping trip, I'm going to talk about you're in an RV. I'm going to talk about glamping. I'm talking about real camping with tents, and we have to make a fire. And, and I want to start with a story because when we talk about fire, um, man, it, it means so many different things to us today that it wasn't quite the same back in the day when in the Old Testament, in New Testament, even some places around the world today still. We talk to Californians about fire. It's different. <laughs> right? But for the most part, um, fire is not something, unless you have like a, a gas stove at home, it's not something that we, we see as, as necessary to living as people did in different times. But when I was out there camping as a Boy Scout, we didn't have backups, we didn't have nothing. Like we were really planning on cooking all of our food over this fire. And if the fire went out, there was problems. And if it was cold, if the fire went out, whole nother set of problems. I mean, we really, really use the fire. You really see the, the, the centralness of the fire to uh, life out, out in woods. And so in the Old Testament, when you see people having fire, it was the same. It was essential to life. It wasn't like an option. Like, oh, the fire doesn't work. We're just going to turn some switches. No, it, was, it, it really meant something different for them. And so I wanted you to kind of see that shift and that difference from how we might think of it today to the time. And we're going to be talking about what fire really represents to them, what it, what it means to them, and why God would show up as a fire. If we take a step back from this entire message so far, I want you to think of two different things. There's a contrast between Old Testament and New Testament. Old Testament and New Testament. Now, we see God represented as a fire in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, but there are still in how people related to the fire and how the fire related to people. So when we talk about build the hearth, stewarding God's intimate presence, that word intimate is key for New Testament. It wasn't in the Old Testament. No one in the Old Testament, no one in the Old Testament would sing the songs we sing today. Nope, not at all. 
in the Old Testament, when there was fire and when God represented himself as a fire, it, it wasn't to just be close to us. There are different instances. And like Pastor Sean said a couple weeks ago, we introduced this series. There's, throughout this series, we're going to be highlighting different aspects of uh, different stories where, where fire was represented there. And, and what does it mean to us? What does it mean when God showed up as a fire? What does, what it, how does the fire reveal the nature of God? And then also, how does the fire uh, uh, refine us? What do, we, what do we do when it comes to, when it comes to that? I want to talk specifically today from this title. It's even in the word hearth that the heart is the hearth. We think about the hearth being a place that, that, that holds the fire, that the, we talk about come be a, the flame upon my heart. The heart is the hearth we're talking about. It's the place where the fire of God, the spirit of God dwells. But it wasn't always that way. In the, New, in the Old Testament, they had a whole different relationship. And so really, really quickly, when God establishes his people, there is a gap between him and his people. He's a holy God and these are knuckleheads. Like they are just, they're just, you know, we, we, but when I say that, I don't say it with, with judgment because I've had plenty of knucklehead moments myself. I don't know about you, but I've got some volumes, encyclopedias of my knucklehead moments. But in the Old Testament, there was not, here's the key, there was not permanent provision for God to unite with his people as one. And so, for example, God shows up on a mountain with, with fire and he wants to call out Moses. Moses, I want you to come, I want to come talk to you, but let the people know, don't come near this mountain, right? Because we don't have this intimate presence established yet. Jesus is going to do that. But right now he hasn't come. Tell the people not to come to this mountain. I'm, just, I'm inviting you to come. I just want to talk to you. If they touch this mountain, they're going to die. So Moses was coming up, talk with God, going down and communicate the message. When the people of God had left out of Egypt, it's another story, but it's similar. It's, it's connected. They left out of Egypt. And Pharaoh let the people go, and Moses is leading God's people all the way out of Egypt, and Pharaoh has a change of heart. Pharaoh's like, nah, I think I want him back. Yeah, I think uh, labor's not going to be the same around here if all of them gone. <laughs> so I think I have a change of heart. And so he decides to get his army to go chase after this, some scholars say, 1.5 million people. This wasn't like a group of 100 people out there in the desert trying to, no, this is a large group of people. So he decides to, to get his army to go chase after the Israelites to go bring them back. Well, what ends up happening is there's a pillar of fire that comes right between them, preventing the army from following them. It's really cool when you hear that story because it was, it was in front. It was leading them. And when the army became, came close, the pillar of fire moved from the front to the back between them. And Allah didn't have light at night. Pillar of fire was helpful. We fast forward to some time where God tells Moses, okay, now that we've moved through all of that, now we're in the, in the desert and y'all already messed up some stuff. You're not going to go into the promised land. You're going to be in the desert for 40 years. So let's, let's develop some of our boundaries here in how we're going to operate in the desert. Uh, I, I want to be able to dwell among my people. So Moses, build a tabernacle. Tabernacle is just a large portable tent. Build a tabernacle so that I may dwell in the midst of my people. Now, he didn't say I'm going to be in my people. Build a separate place, a tabernacle, where my presence will be in there so I can be there where my people are camped all around. And many times the presence of God would be represented by a pillar of fire. And it's the whole camp was all around. But the pillar of fire was right there above this portable tabernacle. It was like a, a temporary temple. And they had the tabernacle until they settled and actually in Solomon built the actual temple, which was permanent. But if you're going to be traveling around and stuff, you're not going to be building a building. You want to have a temple, a, a tabernacle that when you're moving around, you can pack it up, 
move around, when you settle down, set it back up, and have the presence of God in the tabernacle. Everyone's camped all around the camp, campsite. The when it's time to move, you pack it on up. But here's what's interesting. What's interesting is to represent God's presence, God told Moses and Aaron some specific things to do with these offerings inside that tabernacle. And this is what he says, looking at Leviticus chapter 6, beginning of verse 9. Command Aaron and his sons. His sons were the priests. His sons were the Levites. They came from as the of Aaron. And they're the only ones allowed to do anything with offerings and fire and sacrifices. Command Aaron and his sons, saying, this is the law of the burnt offering. So he's telling them how I want it done. The burnt offering itself must remain on the altar's hearth all night until morning, while the fire of the altar is kept burning on it. That's our key. The fire is kept burning on it. The priest is to put on his linen robe and linen garments. He is to remove the ashes of the burnt offering. Uh, the fire has consumed on the altar and place the ashes next to the altar. Then he'll take off his garments and put on other clothes and bring the ashes outside the camp to a ceremonially clean place. The fire on the altar is to be kept burning. It must not go out. Every morning the priest would burn fire. The priest would burn fire, would burn, burn wood on the fire. He is to arrange the burnt offering on the fire and burn the fat portions from the fellowship offerings on it. Fire must be kept burning on the altar continually. It must not go out. Three times God says this fire is not to ever go out. It's not to ever go out. So there's several different kinds of, of offerings mentioned there in the scripture. So one of them is the sin offering. The sin offering, you go up there and, and you, you do an offering for, for the sin to kind of purify the location. Then after the sin offering, you take the stuff that's burnt on, you take all of it off. And then you, then you have the, uh, the peace offering. And the, the, the peace offering was an animal that after it was sacrificed and after it was burned, that, and it represented the fellowship and connection with God. We have peace with God. Then you take that animal off and, and you can eat it and you share with everyone part, as part of the fellowship. This is why the peace offering is different from the burnt offering. The, the, with the peace offering, the animal will be burnt, you know, almost like barbecue. So there's meat there that you take off and then you eat it. After that is the burnt offering. One of the things that's different from the burnt offering is that the burnt offering is completely consumed on the altar. Every aspect of that animal is completely consumed. It's not shared with people. It is all for God. So we talk about God being an all-consuming fire. Part of the context of that is this fire consumed all of the sacrifice offered to God. This was a different kind of sacrifice. So God gave these specific instructions for the priest to put on, put on a particular garment, and, and, and the, the, the uh, offering stays on there all night. Right? Again, we're not taking it off and slicing it up and passing it out like it's 4th of July. No, it stays on there completely consumed. So the priest puts his garment on, takes this off, has a special garment just to take off the burnt offering off the altar and all the ashes and set it down. And he's got to go take that off, dip clothes for the ashes, take it out. Burnt offering. Now, listen, that's a lot of work. Uh, what if you had to do that every morning before you go to work? It's, it's just, it's cumbersome. I mean, it's detailed. But it's what God said to do, so he better do it the way God said to do it. But that's how he had these different offerings and, and the fire. And so no matter where the people went, when they up and moved and up and, it was the job of the Levites, the descendants of Aaron, to keep the fire burning all the time. Man, I remember when I was uh, when I was a Boy Scout, we had different shifts to keep the fire burning all night. It's the same way here, except they did it for forty years. 
The fires will never go out for 40 years. What's so significant about that fire? A couple things. Number one, God started the fire. Fire came out of his presence and lit that bad boy and he kept it going. So one of the reasons why the fire needs on burning and that's not to ever go out is because we didn't start the fire. It was always burning. Another reason why it was to never go out is because it represented the presence of God. And so the fires to always be burning because God was always with them. Don't let the, the fire go out. It represents my reality, the reality of my presence and the, 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 the presence of my presence. Like I'm here with you, but I'm in this tabernacle. And on one occasion, let me, let me read to you what happened. One occasion, look at Leviticus chapter 9. Let's watch what happened here. Leviticus chapter 9, verse 22. Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them. He came down after sacrificing the sin offering, the burnt offering, and the fellowship or peace offering. Moses and Aaron then entered the tent of meeting. When they came out, they blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all people. Fire came from the Lord and consumed the the burnt offering and the fat portions on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell face down. Now, some people say, well, wasn't the fire in the Holy of Holies? Not this one. This wasn't the Holy of Holies fire. This was in, like the, in, in, the, in the, uh, the courts out in front. That's why people could see what was happening. And it was done in front of people. And so Moses and Aaron came out, blessing the people. Man, fire came out and lit that thing up. And, and people rejoiced. And fell down on their face. Now I want you to. I want to show a picture. Of the pillar of fire. This, uh, show the slide with just the pillar of fire. With the, uh, with the tent. This is kind of what it looked like. For 40 years. As they moved around. And traveled around the desert. This is what it looked like. And the pillar of fire would rest right above. That. Uh, uh, that, that, that the, uh, the tent of meeting. Especially when there was uh, an occasion for conversation. But then inside, as they were moving around, in, even during the day, inside there was a flame of fire on the altar, and the Levite's job was to keep it, keep it going. The Levite's job was to keep it going. The Levite's job was to keep it going. God started the fire, and the Levite's job was to keep it going. It was a job of, listen to me, human beings had to work to keep it going. They had to work to keep it going. In the Old Testament, that fire, they could see it. It was, it was on the altar. It was outside of them. You didn't see anybody else run up in there. There was, a, there was distance between the fire and the people. There was a gap between the fire. There is no intimacy there. In the Old Testament. So as they traveled around for 40 years, they had that tabernacle, that, 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 per, that temporary tent. Now watch what happens. After they, uh, I'm fast forwarding a whole lot here. After they settled in the promised land, and many, many years have gone by, you have King David, you have King Solomon, and King Solomon builds the temple, a permanent temple, beautiful building. But the same rule applied. There should be a fire on the inside that should never go out. Second Chronicles chapter 7 tells us what happened. That the dedication of the temple, after Solomon finished praying over the temple, fire descended from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Fire came. We didn't start the fire. He started it. And the Levites to go in, keep it going, keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. Fresh sacrifices, more sacrifices, keep it going, keep it going. That's Old Testament. When we're talking about building the hearth, we have to do it in the context that now we're in a new covenant with God through Jesus. And even though there are some really, really cool stories in the Old Testament, very, very dramatic. 
a lot of the reasons why things were so dramatic in the Old Testament was one, the people of God were still learning about God. So a lot of things were visible. Number two, God had to do a lot of things outside of them because no permanent provision had been made for him to do it inside of them. Old Testament. You see this big cross right here in the back? If we imagine this side over here with the, with the red guitar is the Old Testament. And then this side over here with this beige guitar is the New Testament. There's two different sides of the cross. The cross is what makes the distinction. What Jesus did on the cross is what makes, makes the difference. That's why when we had communion, Jesus said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. So remember the new covenant. Now the stories in the old covenant are, are, are foundational for the new covenant. They point to the new covenant. They point to what Jesus is going to do. But listen, in the new covenant, we don't go back to repeat stuff in the old covenant, even though it sounds cool. I mean, who wouldn't want to see a whole Red Sea part? I mean, I mean, if there's a time where you want iPhones to be invented, it's capture that. Can somebody capture that? You talking about going viral on a sea part? Like we would have loved to have been there. We would have loved to have been there during the wilderness when God was dropping manna and quail out of the sky to feed people. We would have loved to have been there when God made water come out of a rock. We would have been loved to have been there when people walked around the walls of Jericho and the walls just came tumbling down when they shouted. We would have loved to have been there. All that sounds great and amazing, but everything that God did in the Old Testament is inferior to what he has accomplished in the New Testament because of Jesus. Now, we have a tendency to always want to see stuff. That's, that's, we, we, we like the sensational things that appeal to our senses. We want to smell, taste, touch, see, hear. All, we, and so that sound, because it, it appeals to our senses, we can feel that that is superior. That when God does something on the outside that we can see, that that is superior than what he does on the inside that we can't see. But, 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 but based on the new covenant and the things that God established in Christ, it's the things we cannot see that are more superior than the things we can see. And so do not... Do do not neglect the significant because you desire the sensational. Everything that God does that is not going to appeal to your senses, but that doesn't mean that it has to appeal to your senses for it to be significant. The people in the Old Testament, the kings and the prophets who saw all that stuff, they longed to see the day that you and I are in right now where you don't have to go to a tabernacle or a tent to experience the presence of God, but we'd have his presence on the inside of us every single day. They long for it. They long for it. And we're like, well, I would like to see Elijah go up in a whirlwind. That would be cool, but then I got nothing on Christ in you, the hope of glory. We're so driven by our flesh and our carnal nature where we want to just see things happen. Matter of fact, people can, you, we, the presence of God can be in here like right now and someone say, well, I don't feel anything. That's my problem right there. That's my problem. Some of the most significant things I have seen God do, and I'm saying see uh, like figuratively, I, I have not been seen. When, 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 when God shrunk this quarter-sized brain tumor in this lady's head, she didn't feel a thing. But the cat, cat scan said it was gone. God's spirit will move, and he does not guarantee goosebumps. Don't depend on the goosebumps to validate if God did something or not. Look for a changed life. Look for transformation. Now, I don't really know where I was. I think I was talking about fire or something. Let me, let me just, is it all right? Is it, there's just a little bit of fire right there where you can't contain it. Listen, let me just, let me just flow a little bit. Here, listen, 
so Old Testament, guys, listen, one of the, one of the biggest, one of the biggest hindrances to Christian worship going deeper and more intimate is us looking at the Old Testament as a model for how we should experience the presence of God. That's not a model. That's the prequel. That's not a model. A lot of songs come out singing Old Testament theology. That's not a model. I, 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 I respect uh, King David and all the stuff that he did, but David, when he messed up with Bathsheba, he prayed Psalm 51, and, and, and it's like, let me just, this is just an example. I'm not going to camp out here, no pun intended. <laughs> but we repeat some stuff in Psalm 51, some things that David said, in response to him becoming aware of his sin. Now how he had to have a prophet come to tell him that sleeping with somebody's wife and killing her husband is a bad idea. I, why he needed a prophet, I don't know. But let's just assume he had a blind spot. <laughs> Even when the prophet gave him a little parable, David was like, man, that dude should be killed. You should be. And prophet, Nathan's like, is he for real right now? <laughs> David, I got, I got to tell you. I got I to gotta tell you. It's you, bro. It's you. <laughs> he says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew within me a right spirit. Right? And a lot of Christians, we take that. Yeah, create in me a clean heart, renew. Okay, okay. Keep on reading. He says, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. You think you should pray that too? Or is something different? In the Old Testament, God's spirit would be upon you and you act a fool, he'd take his spirit back. Right? His spirit was upon Samson. As long as his hair was long and he kept the Nazarite code and then Samson messed up and, and, and went to the wrong barber and he got a haircut. <laughs> and listen, the spirit left him. And this one Samson who killed thousands of men with a jawbone of a donkey, now he couldn't break a toothpick. The same Samson because the spirit was there and then gone. Spirit was upon Saul and Saul didn't get his act together. Saul kept on messing up and the spirit of God left Saul. David's predecessor. So when David is facing his own sin, he's like creating me a clean heart and don't do to me what you did to other folk. <laughs> don't do my bad God. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but she was taking a bath on the roof. Jesus. What? <laughs> like, so he, so he repents and the thing he's most afraid of is God's spirit leaving him. You and I should never pray that prayer. Because David was over here with the red guitar and we over here with the brown guitar. And so what's interesting, what's interesting is this whole dynamic is, is, is played out in a very unique conversation. And when I preached about this topic with this lady and his, her encounter with the woman at the well in John chapter 4, there's so many other details to that particular story, but there is a, there's a concern that she has that is often overlooked that I want to unpack today for a very specific, specific reason. Because when you leave here, I want you to know, we talk about building the, the hearth and stewarding God's intimate presence. The hearth is really your heart, where the God's fire is. It's, it's in you. It's in your spirit. So this woman who has come out of Samaria to get some water at the well, she's had a pretty rough past. And so normally women come out in the morning when the sun is not out and the sun is not hot. They come out together as a community because, you know, y'all do everything together. 
right? If y'all got to go to the bathroom together, you're sure going to the well together. <laughs> right? It's just little gender differences, that's all. You know, you don't, you've never in your life heard a guy say, man, I got to go. Hey, bro, you want to come? Never in your life, right? Not the ladies. It's a social event. But this woman is not accepted into the group because of her life experiences. So she's coming out at high noon, really hot, and she's coming out by herself. And she encounters Jesus there at this well. Jesus had a divine appointment with her at this well. And he's like, give me something to drink. And she's like, you don't even have anything to draw water from. And besides, you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan. Like, Jews don't even deal with Samaritans. Like, oh, why are you even talking to me right now? Right? You're a guy, I'm a woman, we don't talk in public. You're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan, we don't talk in public. And you didn't even come equipped with, with a bucket. Like, where am I going to put the water at? Well, if you knew who was talking to you, you'd be asking me. Because I've got water that if you drink of this water, I, you will never thirst again. She's like, okay, and you're crazy. Like, this, 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 doesn't, make, this doesn't make no sense. Doesn't make any. Okay, then, smart guy, where can I find this water that you're talking about? Well, you have to ask me, because I'm, I'm got, I got living water. It'll come out your belly, as a matter of fact. She's like, man, I've, if, if my life hadn't been rough enough, I'm running to this Jewish crazy dude talking about rivers coming out of my stomach. <laughs> so they have this whole long conversation and then, and then the, the scene, it switches. Like if you're watching the movie, this is where the music will change. Jesus says, go get your husband. She says, I don't have one. He goes, you're right. You've had five. And the man you're living with right now is not your husband. That's when she goes. I perceive you're a prophet. That supernatural knowledge, we call her word of knowledge, let her know God was present. And this wasn't just a crazy Jewish man who ain't got no friends. God was present. She said, you're a man of God. I perceive you're a prophet. Now here's where the conversation really gets interesting. Because in her mind, she goes, huh, if you're a man of God, there's a question that's been burning uh, in me for a while. And so let me ask this question. This is what she says. She goes, you, you Jews, you worship in Jerusalem. Our forefathers, we worship over here on this mountain. So it's interesting that Jesus calls out stuff in her past, have a real brief conversation about water that is or isn't real, is or isn't living. And when she realizes this guy is a man of God, she asks a question about where's the right place to worship. That's fascinating to me. Where's the right place to worship? If you're a man of God, I've been wanting to ask somebody. And she said, Jesus says this. Look at John chapter four, we'll begin in verse 19. Sir, the woman replied, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worship on this mountain, but you Jews say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus told her, believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Do you see what Jesus did there? He changed the, 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 the topic of where to worship, Jerusalem or this mountain over here. He said, the time is coming and now is where location won't matter anymore. Tents won't matter. Temple won't matter. Location won't matter. Cities won't matter. Because now, because of me, it's not going to be about a place to go, 
because God is going to make you the place. And it won't be about location. It will be about the nature of the worship, spirit and truth. In spirit, it's inner, inward, inside. What's another inward? Just in there. <laughs> the nature of the worship, it'll come from inside of you, spirit. The nature of the worship must be done in truth. Authentic, genuine. That's the kind of worship the Father is going to be looking for. And then their conversation continues, and her life has changed. She goes back to uh, Samaria and tells people about this life changing encounter that she had with Jesus. And more people come out of the city to hear Jesus, and more people believe in him. But it's interesting to me. Out of all the things that could have been on this woman's mind, she said, where's the right place to worship? And he said, it's not going to be about a place anymore. And interesting that you as a, as a woman who have been rejected by your own community, you're the first one to know about it. I'm changing the game. It's not gonna, you don't have to go to Jerusalem. You don't got to go to a mountain. It's going to be right here. And so then Paul, as he's talking to the Romans, he says in 12, verse 1, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. It's not about an animal anymore. An animal that gets burned on the altar and is temporary. As a living sacrifice, not only are you alive, but you are constant. Your life is a sacrifice to him, a living sacrifice. The whole concept, we may have heard the phrase living sacrifice quite a bit, but again, in their time, there's no such thing as a sacrifice that is alive. Literally, sacrifice means it died. So the whole idea of a living sacrifice is completely outside of their paradigm. And Paul says, do you not know that your, your bodies are the temple now? You are the temple. Collectively, as the body of Christ, you are the temple. Wherever you gather, he's going to be there. Wherever you go, you take Christ with you. You don't have to run. I mean, can you imagine? Listen, this is why you can worship in a grocery store aisle. This is why you can worship in your car. This is why you can have a situation in the shower. Because God's presence is with you. Now, he ain't leaving just because you. <laughs> He's with you. you it, when you are in Christ and Christ is in you, there's nowhere you can go without him. There's nowhere you can go without him. I don't have to pray, Lord, please go with me when I go. No, I don't have to pray that. Brown guitar. With a red guitar, the people pray, God, please go with us. Let your spirit go with us. And sometimes he would show that, again, like by the, by the fire or other things, he, he would go with them. Maybe the, he sent an angel. He would go with them. They had to see. He would go with them. With them. With them. With us, he has changed what with us looks like. In the New Testament, with us is in us. I'll be with you always. In the New Testament, with us is in us. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Not on the outside, not sitting across the table from us, in us. It's the in us kind of with us. This is the new covenant. This is why the kings and prophets of the Old Testament wish they could see this day because of all the things that they had to do. All the times they had to run to the tabernacle to go see what God wants, wants to say. All the times they had to do all that. No, not now. You can wake up in the morning and be connecting with God. So we talk about having stewarding God's intimate presence. 
There is, there's no way the Spirit of God can be more united with you than he is right now if you put your faith in Christ. Paul tells the Ephesians that the Holy Spirit has been given to us as a seal. He has sealed us. It's like our, our heaven's deposit assuring us that we are in assuring us that when our life on this planet ends, we're, going to, we're just going to transition to our next location. Like The, the, the Holy Spirit is given like a, da, a, a, a deposit and a seal. And, and the more we think about Old Testament perspectives and trying to live the New Testament life through Old Testament perspective, we're going to miss out on the things Jesus paid for. I respect Abraham, Abraham, Moses, Elijah, David, all of them were cool. Never met them, heard a lot about them. But what I have today, they wish they had. What, God inside of crazy John Harris is more of a miracle than parting the Red Sea. God's spirit inside of me. And inside of you, this treasure in earthen vessels is more of a miracle than walls tumbling down. If I had to choose between being there to watch the walls of Jericho come fall down or God's spirit living on the inside of me and going with me anywhere I want to go, speaking to me anytime he wants to speak and I can speak to him without going through anybody else. If I had to choose between the two. It would be God in me. It'd be my heart being a resting place for God's spirit, his fire. I'll close with this. Let's put this slide up with the, um, on the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, this is one, when you see it, it talks about when the Holy Spirit came and filled that room, and they all were speaking in tongues and heard the sound of a rushing mighty wind. One of the unique things that was said about it is that there appeared these flames of fire, listen, on top of every person's head. A flame of fire on top of every person's head. Now let's go to the slide with both pictures on it. See the difference? I'm glad somebody got it. <laughs> you see the difference? That's the difference between the red guitar and the brown guitar. Old Testament, New Testament. And so when you pray, pray with this picture. Don't pray with that one. When you worship, worship with this picture. Not that one. When you need help, ask for help from this picture. Not the other one. That's the difference the cross makes. This is the intimate presence of God. Now, you might say, well, I don't feel all fiery. <laughs> well, the good thing is this fire is not an emotion. <laughs> it's, a reality. it's a truth. It's not based on our feelings. Our feelings can go up and down. And even when you're feeling down, the fire is still burning. Because we didn't start the fire. Huh? Come on, somebody. We didn't start the fire. In the Old Testament, you had to keep it going, right? In the Old Testament, you had to keep it going. Not New Testament. Now, when we pray and we get together, can we feel more energized? 
Can it uplift us and encourage us? Absolutely. But this flame is an eternal flame. He keeps it burning, whether you're awake or not. He keeps it burning, whether you feel like you deserve it or not. He keeps it burning. When you feel like you want to be around all the saints or when you feel like you don't want to see any saints. He keeps it burning. When you feel like you had a really good moment, a God moment that you're proud of. Or you feel like you're in the depths of shame because of a mistake that you made. He keeps it burning. Jesus said, this is the new covenant in my blood, not your effort. In my blood. The new covenant in my blood. That's why it's so powerful. It's a covenant. And the wonderful thing about making a covenant with God is he can hold the whole thing together when you fail on your part. It's still intact. Your heart is the hearth. God is with you everywhere. And to steward the presence of God, always be aware of his presence. And he's always with you. And this is why it's good to be around saints, because anytime you forget, you can be around some folks that say, hey, 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 don't believe the lies of depression and darkness. He's with you. He's with you. And you all stir it up together. You can stir it up. We come together, worship together, you can stir it up.